You may have seen my video um, looking at using Wireshark to capture the messages that are flowing on the CAN bus, uh, in particular in my case the KCAN uh, bus, on my BMW E87 aging 1 series circa 2006 car. So um, just to give a bit of background in case you haven't been following my race car build series on uh, YouTube, um, I'm building a car to compete in the 116 Trophy series here in the UK. Um, and the car's stripped out. I mean, there's not a lot left inside. And one, one of the things, or two things you do take out, one is the parking detector, um, system that uh, the little ECU that sits in the boot of the car or in the trunk and um, the other is the airbag unit and all the airbags have been removed all of the uh, seat occupancy detectors have been removed the seat buckle detectors have been removed because obviously I'm running a racing seat with a full harness um, seat belt set up so all of these things have been removed and the sum total of all that means that I get, um, when I start the car, I get an airbag and seatbelt warning light come up. Now it's quite normal on these cars to race like that. I've been racing one of these cars all season and those two indicators have been on throughout the whole season in the car I've been racing. So it's not unusual. Um, but I'm trying to figure out a way of extinguishing those indicators so that I've basically got no errors um, on my um, dashboard at all, um, unless something actually goes wrong. And that's what got me into looking at CAN bus and seeing if I could simulate the uh, messages that come from the airbag unit. So the airbag unit, I've seen it called uh, the SRS unit which I think is safety restraint system. I've seen it called MRSS, which I think is multiple restraint safety system, or something like that. Um, but it's the, it's the little ECU that sits under the center console just behind the uh, handbrake. Okay, so that's the starting point. So the objective is to extinguish these uh, lights. And I started uh, explaining a bit about this in my previous video, but uh, somebody kindly um, commented, gave, gave me some feedback and said, this is pretty heavy stuff. And, um, you know, he was struggling to understand it. And I think he was a, a computer science major. Um, so, um, and he's got a good point. I just dived in, you know. So I'm going to try and add some background. So you'll find lots of videos on YouTube. Um, th a lot of them cover the physical and electrical aspects of CAN bus. Um, and the one, a, a set I really like, uh, by on a channel called Mechanic Mindset. The guy on there is it goes into some really great detail. He starts from quite simple um, digital multimeter type readings into using um, an oscilloscope to look at the signals flowing, you know, the, uh, the encoding of the uh, messages on the CAN bus. There are very few videos covering protocol analysis. The one I used was one, called, one on a channel called Pengutronics. Pengutronics has got a lot of, well, as you might have expected, a lot of Linux stuff on it, I think. But you will find a CAN bus analysis um, video on there and he does it in a very straightforward way with a nice controlled setup so um, that's quite that's worth looking at to gain some background. So let's talk about the setup on the car. So as I said earlier I've got I've got a, a BMW 1 Series um, it's old we the 116 Trophy Series um, is based around cars uh, E87s from 2004 through to 2006. So um, the engine variant is N45, um, if you're familiar with that. Um, this is a very simplified diagram uh, and it's drawn in a way that you don't usually see it drawn. You usually see it drawn in a, in a sort of 
hierarchical way, but I'm, I wanted to draw it like this because there's a couple of things I wanted to point out. You see that we have three different CAN buses. We have one called the powertrain CAN bus, um, and the data speed on there is 500 kilobits per second. We have one called the F CAN. I don't know what F stands for, actually, I must admit. Um, but uh, that's also running at 500 kilobits per second. And then we've got the K CAN, which is running at 100 kilobits per second. And the thing that links the three CAN buses together is a unit called the JBE, which I've also heard referred to as a gateway. Um, to me, the closest, because I, 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 I expect there might be some computer literate people watching this, the closest thing I can think of it is like an ethernet bridge or switch. Um, so we've got that. Now, the, uh, we've then got lots of different control units attached to these various CAN buses. So there is a way, I believe, to send requests to uh, one of these control units and get a response. But I haven't really analysed any of those message formats. Everything I've analysed so far has been an asynchronous notification. What I mean by that is that say this unit here, the, the DME, just throws a message out onto the CAN bus and that's all it does, just repeatedly keeps throwing the messages onto the CAN bus. Now the message has an identifier in it, and we're going to look at this a bit later, but it's got an identifier. And if say the DSC was interested in the message with that identifier, it would simply copy that into its memory and start to process that message and do whatever it wanted with that message. And all the other units do exactly the same. They simply throw messages onto the various buses. The DME, um, well, actually, uh, one good one is the DSC and the um, instrument cluster definitely communicate with each other. And if I watch messages over here and the way I do that is I attach a PC with this thing called Wireshark. If I watch messages over here I can see DSC uh, generated messages arriving over here. So they're passing through here. Now as they pass through you can see we've got two different data speeds. So here we've got a clock speed of that achieves 500 kilobits per second and over here we've got a different clock speed. So what that means is it's not simply a, a what's called an electrical repeat of the messages here. The, the frame must be taken in, reframed and then sent out. And that's one of the functions of the JBE. Now, because it does this reframing, it has the opportunity to actually filter. So it could decide that the message that it receives down the, the PT can should not be sent onto the K can. Now, one of the th reasons you might do that, and you can actually see there's a big hint here with these data rate numbers. If you imagine that on this can, we are using say 25% utilization of this can, uh, of this bus. So perhaps we're using 125 kilobits per second. And let's say we're doing the same on the F can. So that's a total of 250 kilobits per second. Now, if I pass all of that data onto the KCAN, you can see it's going to overload it. So, um, so I suspect there are lots of messages that flow on these high-speed CANs that do not arrive on the KCAN. Um, so that's worth knowing uh, that, that not everything is going to pass through. Whether everything from here passes onto these two uh, CAN buses, I don't know for certain. I mean, a lot of this is like reverse engineering the stuff and um, I've only just really got into it. So um, I'm learning as I, as I go. Now messages between, say, the MRSS unit, the airbag unit and the instrument cluster are traveling on the same CAN, CAN bus on the K CAN. Now, although I'm showing this logically like this, it could be 
that everything is what what's called star wired out of the G, G, JBE. So it could be that there's a twisted pair that goes from the JBE to the instrument console, twisted pair that goes from the JBE to the MRSS, twisted pair goes from the JBE to the PDC, etc. But and I haven't explored that, but logically they're all on the same bus. So the electrical signals are simply being repeated onto each um, pair. The E87N45 OBD port does not have a CAN, direct CAN connection. Uh, some cars do, um, but not on this one. So it has a connection called K-Line, which is a single wire connection into the JBE, quite low speed, I believe. And so you can connect uh, a diagnostic device to the OBD port such as a scanner and the scanner will send commands down the K-line and then they will be sent out on the CAN buses. There is an addressing scheme um, and I've managed to reverse engineer the, um, the packets that you see on the CAN bus uh, that are originating from the OBD port. So we'll take a look at that a bit later. One of the reasons I got into all of this was because I connected my AIM data logger to the OBD initially, and you don't see all the, all the metrics. You see a subset of, of the different bits of information out of all of these different units. And that's because they are, I think they're coming through the JBE. So as each of these is sending, you know, sending these notifications that, Lots of people refer to it as a broadcast. So as they broadcast the information, not all of it is coming down this connection and into the OBD, onto the K-line and into the OBD. So you see a subset. Um, that's one of the reasons why I decided to do away with my OBD connection for my data logger and connect the data logger directly into the uh, CAN bus. And in fact, I connected it into the PT CAN. Um, enough of all of that. Let's look at. Let's actually look at some data. So this is this is what this is. If you just run with the default Wireshark pro profile, and the profile just gives you the layout of the screens. If you just run with the default and you load up at one of these CAN traces, uh, you'll have to refer back to my previous um, video um, to see how I did how I captured it. But if you load up one of these. Um, what you'll get is this pretty horrible <laughs> format. format. Um, in fact, you don't even, I've, I've actually messed up my own, um, let's get rid of that. It actually looks like that. That's how it looks uh, by default. Now I'm going to create a new profile um, and I'm going to call it Canvas. Okay, so now I have a new profile. It's based on the default, so uh, it's not got any, um, it's not any different from what you saw before. So these are the changes I'm going to make to this profile. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the time display format to time of day, because I prefer it to be time of day. So you can see I captured this, uh, this uh, trace or packet capture at 1046 um, and in fact if I go into here you can see I did it on November 21st um, at 1046 so it's got full details about when this was captured. The next thing I'm going to do is I don't really need this source and destination um, column um, because these refer to Ethernet columns and uh, I don't really need those. I know it's can, so I don't really need that. Actually, I might leave that in just in case I pick. I was to pick up something else. Do I need the length value of 32 bytes? Well, all can packets, uh, all can frames are 32 bytes long. Uh, I think we'll leave that for the moment. We'll leave that. Um, actually, that's what I just said. There is not not actually true. <laughs> Just to confuse things, um, Wireshark has uh, stuck its own 
um, 16 byte header on the front of this. It, that's very unusual. Wireshark doesn't do that. But if you look here, it says this is a Linux cooked capture. Um, it's just something that it does. So in fact, those first um, 16 bytes of this um, capture do not are not actually flowing on the CAN bus. The CAN bus uh, message starts there. Um, so let's now open up what we have. So here's the first thing. We've got uh, two, we've got an identifier, which is called the CAN ID. And um, then we've got some flags. Um, this is just showing you that they're, they're bit masks. So um, for example, I'll, I'll explain one of the bit masks. Uh, a normal uh, CAN ID is 11 bits long. So you can see there's 11 bits of information there. You can have an extended one, which is 19 bits long. If that was set to one, then you would have 19 bits of CAN ID. But uh, on an E87, we only see um, standard um, length uh, CAN ID, so we can ignore that. Um, I've yet to work out what these other two things really mean. I've got some theories, but it's not really worth me talking about my theories. And then we've got, uh, so that's uh, two bytes. Then we've got, um, uh, oh, that's naughty. Oh no, it's not two bytes, is it? It's four, one, two, yeah, sorry, it's four bytes. Four bytes, of course it is. Okay, yeah, so there's four bytes there, um, which refers to this lot. And then we've got a frame length value, which is, uh, looks as though it's two bytes long. Uh, no, it might only be one byte long. Yeah, one byte long and three bytes of zeros, which are reserved. So this is the uh, standard CAN header and this will be the same across any car um, that you look at. This is this is in, encapsulated, if you like, in the CAN uh, protocol definition. Then comes the problem. Then you've got the payload, which is this lot here, or what you see here. What you include in your CAN packet as payload is totally up to you. Um, it can be complete nonsense. Uh, it's the person who's writing the code that generates the CAN, can messages, uh, the CAN frames. They can decide what goes in here. When I check the documentation for my, um, let me see if I can find this, documentation for my AIM data logger, it tells you about the two different types of connections. I already mentioned you can have an OBD connection and you can see there it talks about K-Line, which is the thing we mentioned earlier. Or you can have what they call an ECU connection, which is actually a powertrain CAN bus connection. Uh, so you can see it says CAN high, CAN low, and these are the colors that my, are on my car. Apparently you can have different colors on some cars, but my car's got these colors. On the powertrain CAN, I should add, because my because the K CAN colors are different, but the powertrain CAN colors, these are the, these are the correct colors. And you can see that it calls, so the OBD protocol is apparently standardized in a document ISO 9141 uh, stroke two. Um, but here's the one for the, um, for the CAN bus and they call it BMW PT6. And I've seen PT6 mentioned somewhere else, but I can't remember where. But anyway, I've sort of referred to it in my own notes as PT6, as being the protocol. I can't find any document that defines PT6. All you can do is reverse engineer the messages, which is a really tall order, except for a guy who runs a website called loopybunny.co.uk has done a lot of work decoding them. So you can see all the CAN IDs down here and then you can see the contents. And in fact, if you click on one, like torque, clutch and brake status, um, he then gives an explanation of the breakdown of the payload and the calculations that you can do. Now, 
he's you can see he's based this on a BMW X1 E84 but if you go uh, if we go whoops back to his home page if I can just do that he's got this filter and it says KCAN1 e, E8X implying it's all E8 84 81 87 values I don't know how true that is but anyway we can put in a filter I'm finding that I, I am getting some differences in what I'm finding but this is a good starting point um, it certainly gets you you know just just gives you a kickstart into uh, looking at um, how to decode uh, these messages um, okay so let's let's look at one so if we look at uh, where is it I want the break breaking force ABS and breaking force so I did a little test you can see I've got brake pressure here now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the, the data in this packet list at the top so let's move the data up to there and then I'm going to do uh, a filter for 0x19e was it let's go back and have a look uh, 19e abs force and braking yeah okay now there are a whole bunch of things that are changing here um, there are some funny counters uh, that cycle and other things but what I want you to do is concentrate on this block of zeros let's see if we can make that a bit bigger this block of zeros here so what I did during this test is I sat in the car switched all the ignition on I didn't start the engine but I switched all the ignition on and then after a period of time I pressed the brake um, so whoops you just okay so we're looking at these zeros uh -huh. so what you can see here is that I must have pressed the brake at 1047 18.622 pretty precise um, and the brake force is gradually increasing uh, which way around you read this uh, well it looks as though yeah that's surprising uh, yeah so it could be only be maybe it's only got a granularity of 255 data points single byte but you can see the numbers increasing there and then it should we should find that it decreases after I take my foot off uh, where are we going with this one five one six one six one five one five zero F zero zero and then yeah I must have taken my foot off the brake completely there um, so the other interesting thing which we can look at here is uh, what's the time between each of these frames as displayed so let's add that as a column I need to pull that over here uh, I don't really need this cam protocol one for the moment so it's sending out one of these messages every 200 milliseconds or every 0.2 of a second if you like you know nominal there's a bit of variation there but nominally it's it's about every 200 milliseconds and um, you're getting a, an update on the status of the brake pedal um, I think I pressed it again later so we'll have a look at look yeah okay so there you go I think I tried various things and pressed it harder and harder as I went um, so so that's so so you can imagine that's the ABS unit if we go back to our diagram that's this unit here throwing out this message about how hard the brake is being pressed now if I have my um, aim data logger connected onto here of course I can pick up those messages and I can uh, interpret them and then display the metric in you know record the metric in my data logger so that's how these things work now a few things I wanted to point out to you particularly those of you who are the 
um, computer science majors. Um, the first thing is if you're look at, used to looking at Ethernet, Ethernet frames have a, a source and destination MAC address. Um, do we want to look at one of those? Yeah, go on, why not? Uh, let's close this briefly. Open up this. Because I've messed with the format, but we'll ignore that. We can look at the uh, this area here. So the, here's, the, here's the Ethernet frame format. Destination MAC address, six byte address, source MAC address, and a type field. In CAN, you don't have a source and destination MAC address. So you don't know where it's come from, which is quite frustrating actually. And if you look at Loopy Bunny, he's actually determined where some of them come from. But you can't really determine it from the actual message. Um, there's no way of uh, figuring out where uh, it's come from because it doesn't have a source MAC address. You don't really know where it's going to because it, 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 it's broadcast. It's not what, what you would call unicast in Ethernet. So basically anybody who's interested can listen for these messages. They all come out onto the bus and you either listen to them and decide you want to process this particular message ID 168 or hex A8 or you decide you don't want to um, and it's as simple as that. So um, that's a bit of a difference um, and then the other thing is the messages are really short so whereas you would have a um, you know a payload in Ethernet of say um, 1500 bytes um, you've got eight bytes here. So one final thing I was going to show you was I have started to try and write a decode for these. So let me see if I can enable that. Um, if there's anybody watching this who knows about writing um, Wireshark decodes, you're probably wincing at this point because I've written it as a poster sector. Um, but uh, let's not get too hung up on that. So uh, you can see here, for example, um, I've managed to uh, figure out um, break force. Um, no, sorry. Yeah, talk setting. Uh, I don't understand this. Uh, I didn't. I don't think I had the car running. Maybe I did have the car running actually. No, because the RPM value is zero. So you can see my decode is needs a lot of work. There are some messages which aren't in the loopy bunny table, so I don't know what they are. Um, some of the can IDs, uh, let's add the can ID in here. There's a column. So you can see we've got some can IDs, 416 or, or 1A0, hex 200, 2 dog 5. We don't know what they are. So uh, I've got to try and figure out what they are. Um, and I haven't done the extended sort of decode other than the fact that I've taken the loopy bunny um, explanation for this can ID and added it in. And then very occasionally, like these ones here, I've attempted to do a further decode. But these are obviously not working correctly. Um, so um, I need to do some work on those. Um, when I do get further with this, if I complete the decode, I will make it available. Uh, I'll figure out a way of sharing it. And I, as I think I mentioned in my last video, I do have a GitHub uh, repository. I could probably share it through that. Um, so, um, but anyway, some, one way or another, I'll share it um, and I'll explain how you install it. It's really easy to install. You just copy the file into a certain um, location and that's all you have to do. I said earlier in the video that I'd cover a bit about OBD uh, messages over CAN bus. Just to explain how I gathered this particular trace we were about to look at, I reinstalled the airbag unit into my car. All I did was wide up an earth and a power supply and uh, connected up the twisted pair for the um, can high and can low onto the um, K can. So, uh, and then I attached my um, USB to can adapter and recorded um, some stuff. 
While I was doing this, I also ran my Top Don Smart Diag Mini scanner. Um, I didn't do, I didn't pull any codes, but what I did do is I just pulled the information about the airbag uh, ECU. So it should, so that you could see things like um, version code, uh, version numbers and, and stuff. Now, it took me some time to reverse engineer this and I have to say I haven't completed this, but I know enough to give you a steer on uh, how the OBD works. Um, if you're wondering, <laughs> how am I able to do this? So I started looking at network traces for IBM in 1977. So I've been doing this an awful long time over the years on and off. Um, so I should be able to do it. Um, be pretty sad state of affairs if I couldn't uh, manage to uh, work out the basics of uh, network tracing um, after all that time. Let me show you one thing. The first thing I discovered was that the OBD over CAN messages all seem to have CAN IDs above hex 600. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to filter this trace to just show um, packets, frames, stop calling them packets, frames um, with this CAN ID. And what you can see is you see a, a very distinct pattern. You see a first frame and we can assume this is coming from the scanner and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll explain actually that, that the assumption is correct and uh, later on. And then you see a response, then you see another frame coming from the scanner and then you see a response from the ECU. Um, and in this case, the response is uh, contained in one, two, three, four, five frames. And then we've got another request from the scanner, uh, an immediate response from the ECU, another request from the scanner, another e immediate response from, uh, in this case, from another. You see, this is a, it's got a different CAN ID. This is coming from a different ECU. So I can do this explaining it to you with the raw bytes shown here on the screen, but what I have done is I've taken a whole sequence and copied it into a, just a text, uh, text file. So here's the first one we looked at, which was request uh, from um, the scanner. And it turns out that any diagnostic device connected to the OBD has an address of F1. And it also turns out that when I spoke about CAN not having a source and, a, and a destination address, as far as I know, it hasn't. It still hasn't. There is no change to that. But what the OBD standard does is it defines the use of CAN ID and then the first byte in the payload as being um, the source address and the target address you can see here. So if we go back to this first one, just to show you where this came from, you can see that I've got CAN ID of 6F, 6FOX1 and then my first byte is 40. And all I'm doing here is I'm sort of hand decoding it up here. Um, now, I was able to go a bit further because eventually, after a lot of messing around, I stumbled over the standard that defines OBD over CAN. And this, and there are variants, by the way, but this particular one is uh, this one ISO 15756-2. And this is the 2016 version. Now you can see that this shows the sender sends a thing called first frame it gets some sort of flow control message back and then it can send what it's called, what it calls consecutive frames. And then you can have more flow control and more consecutive frames if you're trying to send a very big block of data. So this overcomes the issue where you've got a limitation of eight bytes of payload in a standard CAN message. Uh, in this case, what you do is if you've got a message that you want to send that's bigger than eight bytes, what you do is you segment it over a number of frames. So in this case, it's been segmented over a number of frames. And if we look, we've got this first one here is the request from the scanner saying, give me some information. This is the first frame of the information. And this, I believe, is the start of the data. 
There is a length field in here, actually this uh, 01 Fox here, 01 F, 31 bytes of, um, of data. Then we've got uh, a flow control thing. So you can see that this, this digit here being a three is a flow con indicates this is a flow, flow control message that says continue to send. And you can actually limit the number of um, frames that can be sent before you need another flow control. In this case, it's got zero, so you can send all the remaining um, segments, um, it, it, uh, frames in the, each one being a segment of the, the whole message. And then we've got the consecutive uh, frames. So if we count these up, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's six. The, the whole message has been segmented into six individual frames. Um, I haven't found anywhere where uh, the target addresses are documented. I mean, we know F1 is the diagnostic uh, device, but obviously the four zero is this particular ECU, by the way, this isn't the this isn't targeted at the airbag one. The airbag one we already know is six zero one. It's this one here. So that means that um, the address is zero one. That's the target address. Um, and the CAN IDs that are show us. 601 are flowing from the airbag unit back towards the diagnostic device and the uh, ones that say 6F1 as the CAN ID but have a first byte of 01 are flowing from the uh, diagnostic device to the um, airbag ECU. I realise that's going a bit deep there. Um, Maybe I'll do a separate video to show how the OBD messages are sent over the CAN bus. Let's now return to the subject of inter-ECU messages on the CAN bus. I don't think I've got much more to tell you. There's not much more I can tell you at this stage. In summary, you just got to remember that what, what this protocol is trying to do. It's just trying to share information between a number of control units and it does it in a broadcast manner. So it just flings a message onto the bus. And if you're interested in the message because you're interested in this uh, CAN ID, then you process the message. If you're not interested in that CAN ID, you just ignore it. And that's how this thing works. And probably the only other thing to remind you is that, um, or a couple of things, not everything that appears on these CAN buses will appear on the other CAN buses because I think the JBE does some filtering. Well, I know it does because um, it does for the K line. And the other thing is that messages from a diagnostic device attached to the OBD port, such as a scanner, will go down this K line, low speed, single wire connection into the JBE and then be packaged up and sent out on the CAN bus. So I hope you found that useful and uh, I'll keep you informed as I make progress.